What we are going to jump to now is the outer bladder line, the outer bladder line, okay? And uh, what you notice here in this green, green arrow is that it, it steers clear of the lateral border of the paraspinal muscles, right? So this is actually, in fact, how we learn to palpate these points. We're supposed to feel for the erector spinae or the erector uh, paraspinal groove muscles um, the lateral border where it, where, it, where, it, where it ends. And that's actually the line along the spine on the other side that we insert for the outer bladder line. And so what we're doing when we're palpating that, we're actually felt we're palpating the lateral border of this retrospinal group. And by, by, by palpating that and putting a needle lateral to that, we are steering clear of the dorsal MI. And what could we then be stimulating? We are stimulating the ventral MI. Now, certainly, the ventral MRI can be stimulated in many different places. It can be stimulated more lateral. Imagine more like bladder line, uh, sorry, gallbladder line level. It certainly comes around to the front. We can stimulate from the front. I mean, if you de needle even from the from the dorsal, from the inner bladder line, you needle deep enough, you pass the dorsal MI, you will get to the, vent the ventral MI. So it's not the only place that you can stimulate the ventral MI, but it's very interesting is that it is the first place you can get to the ventral rem night without what I call contamination or what my students call contamination or pollution from the dorsal rem night. So in, that in itself is quite um, impressive, means the ancient people that pass on these points gave us the first convenient spot to do something without redundancy. And that is a beauty of the anatomical interpretation of the points that we've inherited is that um, you will see time and time again, specificity like this, that they wanted to allow us to have full control. Um, uh, as a, uh, Assuming that is possible, at least the illusion of control, that you could target and pinpoint, no pun intended, the specific ramifications or branchings of any nerve. We see that that pattern passed down again and again. There's always going to be a point um, before the branching happens, and there's always a point for each of those subsequent branches. Um, not one more or not one less. So it, when you look at it from that perspective, you, you're, you know, you're just shaking your head and in awe, wow, this is so precise, this information that they pass down to us that these points as maps, I call them treasure treasure maps to to the nervous system, and it is it is like no nerve is no you know, the expression no stone is left unturned. There's no nerve that's not a sign of point. Okay? It's it's very very elegant uh, map that we've um, that we get to work on every day. So a little bit more detail about the uh, lateral the ventral MI. It, again, if it's at the level of the vertebrae sorry, the, the ribs, then it's called, it can be called in, intercostal nerves, okay? Now, these muscles here on the side, where my laser pointer is pointing to, would be the ribs, the, inter, sorry, the intercostal muscles in between the ribs. The ribs are not visible over here, but you do see the sternum where the ribs um, do uh, attach to the, um, the cartilage over here, okay? Um, and now, I want you to just follow the main main trunk of the intercostal nerve it comes around to the to the front okay and it makes two fascial exits it makes a fascial exit close to the midline midline will be right here so lateral to the midline on either side as you can see from the other side you have what's called the anterior cutaneous nerve okay and then it, it makes a fascial exit on the on the um, uh, what's called the mid axillary line so it's to find the standard axilla and come straight down from top to bottom, then you have down the side of the torso, you have a lateral cutaneous nerve. And each of these nerves makes their own cutaneous branches. Okay. So this, this nerve, intercostal nerve, will innervate the rib muscles, intercostal muscle itself. And it will actually, uh, dip, um, if it was, let's say, in the um, 
uh, lower in the abdomen or in the uh, the waist level, it will actually inter innervate the muscles like the oblique, the rectus abdominis muscles. Okay, but obviously it's those ribs there, so there's no intercostal muscles to innervate. But higher up in the torso, where the rib cage is located, those where, where there's no abdomen um, abs muscles or you know these uh, oblique muscles, then it will innervate the um, the uh, the intercostals. But after it innervates these muscles. It becomes cutaneous and it has a branch towards the back. It's called a dorse. So that's called the dorsal lateral cutaneous. And this is the one in the front here is called the anterior lateral cutaneous. Okay. And then the anterior cutaneous, when it branches medially and laterally, would, be, would then be called med the medial branch or the lateral branch of the anterior cutaneous. Okay. And so this becomes important because these, these uh, fascia exit and these branches actually are correspond nicely to um, uh, different meridians uh, along the torso. Okay. There's, there's quite a high level of specificity. Tony, I have a question. Normally we save them to um, the Q&A period. Just to let people know, keep posting your questions and we'll moderate them. So the first question is, so stimulating the outer bladder will still stimulate posterior cutaneous branch though, is that correct? Yes, it would. Um, it would because you've had to pass through the skin. So, the, so I'm talking the posterior cutaneous branch of, so uh, I'm assuming the question means that from the dorsal MI, there is a cutaneous branches of the dorsal MI of which there's further medial and lateral branches. So well, if, if we want to get very, very precise, putting the needle on the lateral bladder line will stimulate the lateral cutaneous branch of the dorsal MI. Okay. Then, but if you don't go deep enough, you won't. You uh, if you don't go deep enough, the lateral um, um, lateral to the erector spinae muscles, the paraspinal muscles, you may only be getting the cutaneous dorsal MI and not actually be getting the ventral MI. So, and the follow up then is yes, yeah. so both the ventral and dorsal MI have different um, afferent, or have di sorry have afferent and efferent. Yes. Yes, they do. As you can see, they all become cutaneous. They all have continuous branches, right? So, um, so uh, if, even if you were to like need this directly inside that cable, a bunch of wires, some of those wires are coming from the lateral cutaneous. So, information will be traveling from distal to proximal back into the spinal cord to create some kind of reflex, some out of visceral effect. So, what the significance of the reason why? there's a, you know, such a thing as the inner bladder line and outer bladder line. And think about it, it's because it corresponds to the dorsal remi and the ventral remi of the, of the uh, spinal cord. And it's interesting that, if you, that we inherited this knowledge that the middle bladder line and outer bladder, the medial bladder line and outer bladder line are both from the bladder, right? That is something we take for granted. But think about that. Why wasn't it called a, a gallbladder line or some other meridian? The fact that they considered it all from the bladder actually means that they knew there was a relationship via the anterior and, uh, and the posterior RMI, that they actually share some, some common source of innervation. Okay? And, uh, and um, so now we're ready to take this a little bit further and consider some of the other some of the other um, uh, channels that are that exist uh, on the torso. If you were to look at the the midline, the absolute midline, uh, um, where the spinous process of the vertebrae are located, that would be the do meridian, the governing vessel meridian. The governing vessel meridian, if you were to needle superficially, would be at the location where the two medial branches of the dorsal cutaneous nerves of the, um, of the um, cutaneous nerves of dorsal rami um, converge. That's the name for that. So anastomosis, and um, so you can see how that is more powerful because you're getting more afferent input. Right, you're getting twice the afferent input. Two, two for the price of one. Right, and and there's no reason. There's, therefore, it's of no surprise that the you know governing vessel is, as an extraordinary vessel is some is considered to be. A, a more of a deeper level of treatment or more of a, um, a profound level of treatment. Now, there um, are people that believe that the reason why we have the governing vessel um, point passed down to us is that 
it's actually stimulating the spinal cord directly. So what that will imply is that you are going to put a needle so deep in between the two vertebral um, to in adjacent vertebrae, and you somehow pass through a lot of ligaments that are protecting that area so that you actually enter into the, the, um, the space, okay, where the vertebrae is located. Obviously, that is very dangerous, okay, and obviously that is not something that is uh, recommended for you to do unless you have I would say that's only something you would even think about doing if you're dealing with somebody who has like a spinal cord injury and they're already paralyzed below the waist, right? So Western medicine has given up on that. You know, that would be the situation you might consider actually needling that deep into the dew or into the spinal cord directly. Um, they, I, uh, uh, I'm sure you have heard of anecdotal stories, or perhaps your masters, that you know with needle gallbladder 14, for example, or so not gallbladder, um, do 14 or, or do four, so deep that pe people feel shock into the hands, think into the feet. In order for that to happen, is that it, they have actually needle into the, the the spinal cord itself directly. Okay, so it is doable. It is something that anesthesiologists do. Okay, um, to, to think in terms of epidural. That's what epidural is. is it is putting the delivering the medicine into that space um, uh, where the spinal cord is located. Um, um, so, in terms of anatomically, you know, uh, from the perspective of the tip of the needle being able to go through between something without obstruction and reach somewhere, it is something that's achievable anatomically. Um, but uh, um, uh, definitely not recommended, but that's one way you can think about the governing vessel or governing meridian. Uh, we, as we know, the governing vessel is you know supposed to con uh, from two sixteen connecting to the brain. You know it goes it goes um, um, all the way all the way down to uh, do one with the tip of coccyx is one way you can think about that. What that channel theory is describing is actually the spinal cord itself. Okay, so. Um, um, so in in uh, very uh, 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 desperate times calls for desperate measures. If it's a desperate times, you can consider that love that depth of stimulation. Otherwise, we are um, assuming that you're simply needling in between the spinous processes. And uh, what's not shown over here is that um, there's a lot of ligaments right in between uh, pr protecting the spinal cord. Um, but there's also ligaments in between the spinous process. So imagine there's like a two spinal process. There's an inter there's an inter spinous process muscles, but also ligaments in there. Those ligaments, believe it or not, are actually also innervated. Ligaments have an innervation of their own, and those are afferents. So when you needle in between that space, you want to feel some resistance. That is the ligaments that you are you are uh, pecking or or uh, uh, entering, and by stimulating those ligaments, which are afferents, will give you that reflex effect going back down into the um, to the um, to the uh, spinal cord. Okay. Now, what about remi? Right. So remi, the conception vessel, would be the meeting point of the two medial branches of the anterior cutaneous nerve coming from the ventral remi. So it will travel back to the spinal cord bilaterally, right? So again, two for the price of one, very powerful in that sense, and, and uh, uh, create a reflexive effect, right? And that can potentially explain mood points, mood points, which also are sort of like, uh, the, the, uh, an the um, analogs of the back shoe points um, in the back, how can these points have a have an effect on internal organs? It's through these afferent, specifically the eventual remi afferents back into the spinal cord, which then has reflex effect. And then look, that's that little guy there is a sympathetic, sympathetic chain. It will stimulate the corresponding segment of this chain. And whatever those segments of this, whatever those ganglions in the sympathetic chain regulates in terms of internal organs, that will be the, the stimulation to those organs. Thank <music> you.